Okay, so hello and welcome to the Wiser Tomorrow podcast. Today I'm here with Dr. Ben Miles, host of the YouTube channel of the same name and founder of several ventures, including Spin Up Science, a company committed to championing research scientists turned entrepreneurs by helping them bring innovative technologies to the market. Ben is also himself a trained research scientist, having completed his PhD in physics with a focus in nanophotonics and nanophysics from the University of Bristol. So Ben, again, thank you so much for taking the time and it's been a conversation I've been really looking forward to. Awesome, yeah, no, thank you for having me. Of course. So I say we go ahead and just start from the beginning. I'm very interested to hear more about your own background and how you got from, from a research scientist to entrepreneur, which is sort of the, the focus of all of your ventures online and otherwise. Yeah, sure. A, um, a slightly winding tale, so I'll, I'll short circuit some bits of it, I suppose. Uh, I guess academically, as you described, my background is I'm an optical physicist specializing in nanophotonics. Uh, I finished at the University of Bristol my PhD around 2016 or so uh, and got the lucky opportunity to spend a bit of time in a uh, spin-out venture from the university commercializing a piece of chemistry uh, that we hoped one day would be maybe a cure for diabetes, optimistically. Uh, that company went really well um, and was acquired back in 2018. And really I became fascinated with the process of how do you take interesting ideas, breakthrough ideas that scientists come up with as part of the core remit of what it means to be a scientist um, and make sure that they don't just end up as an interesting paper that maybe a handful of people read. <laughs> Uh, but actually the, the impact goes on to reach you know, the, the patients that are intended or change, changing uh, the direction of climate change or any of those sorts of things. And it was always interesting to me how rarely those things actually happen. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's one in several hundred, if not seven, several thousand uh, that, that actually turn into a bright spark idea, which always was very confusing to me. So I, I started my first company really with the goal of saying, well, I've gone through that process of being fundamental academic research scientist and transitioned into someone, I'll politely refer to myself as like moderately useful, but not that useful yet. <laughs> um, it's like, how do I encourage other people to go through that process also? Um, you know, because the, the pathway is fun and because there aren't that many jobs in academic science or industry at the moment. So I like the idea of like, how do we create more um, impact as well as more opportunities for scientists like myself, totally selfish. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll create this company, Spin Up Science, really with that goal, raise the visibility of entrepreneurship as a pathway for scientists, prove that they can actually go straight out of the lab and into raising investment and running a company, uh, and then hope that kind of the wheels of impact uh, are generated from that point on. So uh, a lot of what we do is kind of educational, which is what I enjoy doing. Um, but we also sit on the building side too. So we co-found companies with academics that have great ideas that otherwise maybe wouldn't be pushed to actually turn them into something. So we kind of lower that, um, that yeah, that, that burden of getting things started and make sure the early stage pathway is reasonably easy to navigate. Um, and then every venture I've built since that point has broadly been around that kind of thesis as and when we've encountered different problems like no one understands science, particularly not early stage investors most of the time. Mm -hmm. So like, how do you make sure that, you know, money is going towards causes that are actually impactful and not towards kind of magic, uh, which is otherwise so easy to, to attract. So we built a company around making sure we present the best deals possible to really astute investors and make sure that the science is well diligent and all of those sorts of things. Uh, and then we built software companies around that to make sure that uh, we didn't go insane trying to manage all of the different companies, basically. So it's made the mistake, I guess, early on I identified of like not doing the sensible thing, which is being a serial entrepreneur, which means that you s finish one and then move on to the next one, which is like a very reasonable way of doing things. I made sure. the mistake of being a parallel entrepreneur <laughs> and then finding myself in, a, in an abyss of quite a lot of things to do. Uh, and then thought, hey, I'll start a YouTube channel on the side also. Um, <laughs> all complimentary. Sure. Uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. that was a um, that's a that's a very shortened version of the chaotic pathway that's gotten me where I am at the moment. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, so I'll kind of jump around. <laughs> One is that you did it's from my understanding you've been a YouTuber in some sense for a long time, right? I mean, that's I think you were uploading videos during your PhD and during your postdoc, so that's not necessarily a new endeavor. Totally, yeah. I mean, if I 
uh, I mean, maybe anticipated a slightly divergent pathways, but if I hadn't gone into physics, I would have loved gone into something like film school. Um, so mm. I was always interested in kind of scratching that creative itch. Uh, my PhD was an exercise in sitting in, I'm an optical physicist, right? So sitting in a room with the lights turned off, talking to no human beings, perfect physics <laughs> scenario. Mm. Uh, but as a consequence, I was like, oh, I do actually want to reach out and talk about what it is I'm doing. If anything, just to demystify that this pathway is again, totally possible to walk and if I can do it other people can definitely definitely do it um, so yeah I mean that became my first kind of escape of you know sit in the lab by day and then produce YouTube videos about interesting things I was looking at by night uh, and then my supervisor was like you should probably get on with the PhD uh, so I <laughs> quieted down the YouTube activity and actually started harder on the PhD at that point mm -hmm. and then you have several the, you have several other ventures you alluded to already in addition to spin up are those sort of are those under the scope of spin up or are those entirely separate but in some sense parallel? Um, the, the, so they're not under the scope of uh, spin up science at all at the moment. Um, the idea, I guess, was that we were. Uh, well, I was trying to bring about change in the world where the marketplace wasn't really ready um, to to kind of support the things that I wanted to do. Right, so I wanted very early stage to just go in straight away and help. Uh, university researchers build companies from their ideas and there weren't really any right so I realized actually I had to go back a step and be like okay raise the visibility if this is a pathway encourage people to be interested in these sorts of things then you can build the venture accelerator piece and then only after that was I like okay there's actually a real shortfall in the number of people that feel comfortable looking at an early stage scientific deal and hearing something like synthetic lectin or quantum algorithm or any of the many words that you may come across and feeling like they can diligence that and make a sensible well-informed investment decision and it's all well and good like they do the sensible thing and just say no i can't invest in it but someone's got to invest in these things to get them out the door um so i was really passionate about the idea that we lower the barrier to perceived risk in those sorts of pieces and make sure that early stage companies were actually getting started um, so that's a separate company called science angel syndicate We've got a membership of investors really interested, uh, some of them scientists, some of them not. So we kind of collaboratively now can look at things that otherwise maybe would be beyond any one individual member, um, which, yeah, which, which is really exciting, I guess. It, it means that that investment piece is really coming together for early stage companies in the UK. Um, and then, you know, how that evolves from that point on, I think will depend on what the market kind of needs um i kind of have that ethos for all the businesses that i run i'm very much mm -hmm. interested in building something relevant to the marketplace and if it's no longer needed well that's it's kind of fine uh because i'm i'm much more motivated by the social mission of making sure that this kind of activity happens than by having ownership over the venture that is the one thing doing it in that space i happily welcome competitors uh, into the space because then it means we can do one less thing <laughs> that would be great <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that's i wanted to narrow in a little bit on the sort of the problem statement that these companies are looking to address because it, i don't think people are aware that this is this might be the dominant bottleneck to realizing so many different technologies i mean a lot of the information is already out there for so many amazing things and yeah you I mean it just sits dormant across these journals so um are there many people doing what you're doing at the moment or are you sort of a standalone company for the moment? Um, I mean, there's there's a handful of small entities, I would say. Uh, and there's a really big push by kind of central government to galvanize this sort of activity, except very rarely is it focused on the thing that's actually important, right? Which is the cultural change needed to motivate people to do these sorts of things. Because I don't think many people go into scientists with the end goal of being an entrepreneur. Right, like if you've done that, you've probably been <laughs> misdirected at Absolutely. some point along the way. Mm -hmm. Computer science, sure, uh, but not you know experimental physics. You're not like yes, entrepreneurship's in my future. Yeah. Um, so I think there was a real education piece that needs to be done around saying that pathway is possible, but there's a lot of just structural things that aren't quite right. Um, I mean, I always find it interesting that you know maybe the worst thing you could possibly do for a great breakthrough idea that might have impact on the world is write a paper about it like definitively the worst thing you could possibly do right because if you published it and you've not patented it well no one can now patent it and every uh, there's a lot of kind of obviously like 
controversy potentially around patenting and making things you know available and the taxpayers already pay for them and things like that but i guess the the fact of the matter is if there's still further development work that needs to be funded progressing that idea or say you have an idea that now you need to spend however much money 100 million dollars say going through the regulatory process to prove this new novel drug compound doesn't accidentally kill kill people or have some other real effects or something well, spending that $100 million, anyone looking at it without any guarantee that after they've spent it, they, they can be the ones to you know, leverage it into the marketplace and recoup that initial investment into that technology. Everyone basically is kind of in a game of chicken. Like I always assumed that my role as a scientist was to have great ideas, write about them, metaphorically throw them over the fence. Industry would pick them up and run with them. And that's definitively the exact opposite of what happens, which I just think, not enough people are aware of <laughs> um, and like just fundamentally means I, I guess like the system and the way we think about discovery needs to change not motivated by commercial gain but motivated by making sure things actually get out into the world mm -hmm. yeah it seems like there needs to be kind of an overhaul of the entire system as you're sort of alluding to but what do you think about uh, what might need to change in terms of the education within scientists? Do you hope to see a future where scientists do get a more holistic background and some training in entrepreneurship, business, finance, communication? Or do you think the solution is more found in companies like yours, essentially a middleman who fills in those gaps and still goes ahead and leaves the scientists to be fully dedicated to the research itself? Yeah, so I, I guess like my ethos is it's much easier to teach someone who is a world-leading expert in quantum mechanics enough about business to start a business, right? Whereas I could spend mm -hmm. decades trying to teach a really experienced, 20 years in business uh, person, enough about quantum mechanics to say anything sufficiently interesting where they could make some sort of breakthrough discovery and carve out a unique value proposition and build a company around it, right? So it's really about using human capability in kind of a downhill <laughs> way, like, like tack on the skill sets that unlock the technical expertise because you've already got people that are like super smart, super capable. But I think the kind of dishonest thing we do in science is we're like really keen to fill the funnel, right? All science communication is around like inspiring the next generation of science. We've got tons of scientists. We don't have enough jobs for those scientists. You know, yeah. like that's not the problem. The problem is like we don't actually then galvanize that into any meaningful reality and any very viable kind of job spec for people. Um, I think it's, there's a study, I always quote this study, but there's a study by the Royal Society back in 2010 that said within one year of graduating, half of all graduating PhD scientists will be working outside of science forever, probably working in a bank or as accountant, because right? they just aren't mm -hmm. jobs in academia or industry. So I was like, you need to solve that piece um, in order to make any meaningful change and to be genuine to the idea of trying to push people into science, because it can be super impactful. But can only be impactful if the blue skies capability is directly coupled to how the market the government all other pieces of society actually function to deliver those results mm -hmm. and then what are your thoughts in terms of, of what you mentioned before in terms of uh you know the way patents are sort of restricted or or how intellectual property is managed and, and held by the government by universities and so on what changes would you like to see on that front oh if you're comfortable getting into that because as you said i know that's quite a dicey territory so feel free to there is a there's a huge number of things that should change i mean one of the i like keep on dabbling with the idea of making a video around it but also um don't want to tank everything that we've done to date is mm -hmm. that um you know there is one of the hardest pieces of starting a science company is getting your idea which you have created and discovered out of the university instrumentation and out into a into a spin out company or new co or whatever it is to actually get the thing started there's a really confused in my opinion ownership uh kind of appropriation that happens within universities you know find that it happens within companies you're paid as an employee you're there to you know probably with a boss probably with an hr department probably with a whole bunch of structures with a goal and some security of the direction um so yeah any ideas you come up with are to service the company that's kind of the existence of it but when you're in university and you're a researcher you've brought in that money right you've applied for a grant you've won it 
half of that money has gone into the university to pay for the university running. You're allowed to do research off the other half of that grant more often than not, which again, not something most people realize. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you come up with an interesting idea. You come, it off, come up with it off your own back, maybe talking to some colleagues, but if they're in your field, very rarely are they in your university. Uh, so you probably work with other organizations and yet at the end of the day, university then takes kind of ownership of that idea and you have to go request, knock on the door and then pay quite a heavy lump of flesh to get access to it and then turn it potentially into a company. And honestly, at that point, like the average scientist who's probably best placed to say what that idea could turn into and how to realize it from, you know, early kind of slightly scruffy around the edges to something really viable, that person is totally disincentivized and exhausted by the process to then say, okay, this is a fight, I'm gonna fight. Um, so most of the time they just kind of walk away. Um, which I think is a, a shame because those are the people that kind of create these ideas or they just say, let's keep it on the bookshelf. Don't worry about it, guys. So those sure. pieces need to change. It seems, you know, whenever I've had a conversation, whether on the podcast or just in my personal life, PhD students, post postdocs, people with long term traditional research careers, there seems to be a consensus on this issue and many others. That's the thing that is confusing in terms of why the change seems to be so slow is typically if you have these conversations anyone who's been through graduate school on any level has has experienced this firsthand and is well aware of the problem yet nothing seems to change and as you alluded to i mean it's people feel that there's it's almost dangerous to speak out on this topic and it's it's it begs the question what what can we do as, as the broadly speaking scientific community to to push this forward outside of the university system i mean if we have a a good natured admin within these universities who wants to go about trying to push for this change, then great, but I'm not counting on it. So what might be your advice to the broader community in terms of what we can do to help realize some of these changes? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think part of it is grassroots movement from the inside. Uh, a lot of what is probably some of the most popular things that we do are teach people how to negotiate, specifically around how to negotiate extracting IP out of the unit, as ludicrous as that sounds, very specific kind of course, but um, you know, we've probably had 3000 people go through it in the UK alone. Um, so there are 3000 people out there that now know some of the things that you can do to more elegantly kind of leverage things out of um, that kind of position, which does change things. Um, I think as the system kind of is gently antagonized by people that are gung-ho enough to knock on the door and ask the awkward mm -hmm. questions, um, it improves it for other folks. Right. And as representing investors, we also try and come in and say, you know, we aren't trying to get this out the door now and make it successful. That isn't the difficult barrier. The difficult barrier is series A, B, C later down the line. And we want to make sure that the thing is the right shape broadly to survive those things. So you need to be very sensible in how you license the technology into a new company, the ownership that things like universities take or, or people that won't be adding value to the entity going forwards. There's a whole bunch of different things. I think it would be great if government just came in and pulled a big lever and said, you know, this is the policy across the board, everyone would hear. Um, but hey, I, I think we're probably a little ways away from anyone doing something like that. Though they are looking into it, I think in the UK at least. Yeah, no, I hope so. It seems like the UK may in fact sort of lead. I know there's people like yourself, of course, but I've heard many of the good news on this front I do hear coming out of the UK. So hopefully they will continue being leaders in this space. T totally, yeah. I mean, some, I won't name any names, but some of the institutions we work with have moved from taking two thirds ownership in any new company created, like two thirds ownership. Like, so that means the person that invented the technology and will run it for the next seven years has like, <laughs> one third ownership at best and it's probably fine think, but, yeah. you know so like nah, don't even bother um down to like much more reasonable things maybe like kind of 15 20 percent and that's still a little bit high on all honesty but it's getting there it's improving um i think this step in the right direction excellent. exactly exactly okay great so i want to shift gears a little bit to your sort of science communication hat um, so you have a YouTube channel um, mm -hmm. named after yourself, and you, at least previously, were the host of a podcast, Scientist to CEO. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So are, both, are those both still active projects for you? The YouTube channel, I know. I think you uploaded quite recently. And then yeah. in terms of the podcast? Uh, yeah, so the podcast we kind of do on seasons. Um, mm. It's one of those things that we try and fit in around all of the other kind of bits we're doing. So it isn't kind of core to... 
uh, what what we do in maybe to the extent that it should be. Um, but I think it's a really important piece of the puzzle because it's showing that you can walk that pathway and evidencing that there are examples of people. Because I don't think it's very useful to see like someone that's been there and been successful. You know, like you can't really like how like where you are and where like an ultra successful person they're just so far away from each other that like you kind of just want to see the baby steps in between and that's actually how you get started um so we try and showcase people that have like just entered into the role and a lot of the conversation is around uh you know how does it differ from actually being a scientist and how do you realize that actually being a scientist makes you unbelievably capable running a business just because a lot of the kind of structures of how you think about things are very similar um, the metrics maybe are just a little bit different. So that was kind of the goal behind that. Um, I think we'll do another season in a couple of months or so. Um, but the YouTube channel is something that kind of ticks on. Honestly, I wish it was a core part of any of the businesses. I'd like to make it that, but it's really kind of a evenings and weekends hobby, I suppose. Uh, hence why it's not, maybe not as regular as it should be. <laughs> sure, but I noticed, I mean, I think it was your second most recent video from the time of this recording went quite viral, right? I mean, I think it's over 4 million views at this point. So that might sort of justify that direction. I mean, if you keep getting a response like that, it seems it will it will justify more and more time. Yeah, totally, totally. I think, uh, you know, all you have to do is say that the universe doesn't exist and it turns out people are quite interested by that idea. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's always riding the line between clickbait and just genuinely what you are talking about, which sounds crazy <laughs> on first instance, uh, but is actually, you know, some, some piece of reality. Mm -hmm. Well, what what I enjoyed about that particular video and many of your videos, and I'm sure this would be uh, agreed upon by most of your audience, is the fact that a lot of the science communication, especially on YouTube, I think suffers from uh, a heightened degree of superficiality. A lot of it just, it has a similar sort of clickbaity nature, which again, that's the name of the game. You got to get people to watch the video. Um, but once you actually spend though, you know, however long it is, 5, 10, 15 minutes, you walk away hearing the same several po talking points on quantum computing and, and fusion and so on. So it's great to see somebody with the relevant background who goes into sufficient depth. And I, I would wager that's exactly why the video did as well as it is. So I wanted, I wanted to ask, do you have any similar sort of complaints about other science communicators? Because that's something that I feel very strongly and I've had, and of course not, not <laughs> looking for you to reference any names in particular, but oh, as in, in general. Uh... Oh yeah, I mean, feel free to share the list. You're welcome to. But, no pressure to it, at least. <laughs> um, yeah, I always kind of have a, you know, I don't, um, I guess, relate to the term science communicator necessarily. I think, um, how do I feel about that? I guess, you know, part of the reason I, I, I guess, was interested in putting things on the internet was that I wasn't seeing the sort of things that I wanted to consume exactly to your point that things were presented very kind of surface level and very kind of mm -hmm. surface level I was like okay well you know like it's you're pointing in the right direction but really I'm interested in like the nuance that comes a couple levels deeper I have a real problem in that I can't make a video around something that I don't have genuine obsessive interest around um, I just kind of run out of steam and I, I chuck the whole project, which is not maybe not a, a rob, the right thing to do, but it is the thing I do. Um, and to do that, you know, it needs to have taught me something outside of what I've learned to date, I guess, um, in sitting in science reasonably deeply. Um, and I like the, yeah, I, I really like the communication of like the nuance and subtlety of understanding of things. The difficult bit, I think, is, well, particularly you mentioned things like quantum mechanics, like you have to go through the kind of rigmarole of the initial explainer. You know, if I have to hear a cubic can be anything between zero and one ever again, mm -hmm. like I just, <laughs> I just, exactly. you know, I'm just like, oh, it's so tough to have to get through that bit just to talk then about the really interesting pieces. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, the really popular science communicators obviously suffer from needing to do things that are clickable and mass consumable. And I think obviously that works as an awesome way to run, run a channel if that's kind of the end goal. I think it sometimes means that the, the deeper stories go untold because they're too complex. Um, not that I profess to be a master of telling those sorts of things by any means, but yeah, I would just like to see things that were 
kind of prepared for a science audience, I suppose, rather than a general consumer audience. And it's my fundamental belief that if you talk through something clearly enough, anyone, regardless of science background, can broadly be able to follow you, even if you touch the deepest of the deep, you know? Um, so that's my goal, and I guess that's the bit I really enjoy doing. I like the idea that it can be taken from like, here's first touch point all the way to here's like the truest, most interesting novel bit of cutting edge came out last week research. Mm -hmm. um, I like that kind of story. It means that scripting takes a while, but um, <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, that's where the motivation comes from, I suppose. Yeah, no, I would agree completely. And uh, I know you said you're tired, so hopefully this won't pu push the limits a little too much, <laughs> but I would love to hear a little bit more about the research that you yourself did during your PhD and postdoc. So just to give um, you some context, my I, I did my master's, I completed at the beginning of this year in chemistry with a focus in applied nanotechnology. And my research was centered around semiconductor quantum dots. So nanotechnology, I'm at least reasonably familiar with. Um, and I, I reckon, go ahead, yeah. sorry. You're like totally relevant. You're like the most relevant person <laughs> I've ever talked to to talk about my Really, that's so good that's to perfect. hear. Um, I did something really niche, I would say. Um, I developed a new way of doing microscopy called interferometric cross-polarization microscopy, which doesn't really mean much, but breaking down each of those individual words, interferometer, um, you know, the same sort of device that we measured the gravitational waves with, colliding two laser beams and watching kind of interference patterns uh, that resonate between them. Um, Cross-polarization means uh, that light can come in many polarization directions. I'm sure you know this, but just to give a bit of a general explanation, uh, we interfere X polarized light, so light wiggling up and down, with Y polarized light, light wiggling back and forward. And if you do that, you don't get any interference pattern, unless you have something in the way of that light. So only when you have something, preferably a small piece of uh, gold, like a nanoparticle of gold, like uh, that, that really strongly resonates with the laser beam that you're using, do you get some of that Y wiggling polarization knocked off in certain directions, hopefully some of it in the X direction. And that then does, does give you interference patterns. So it allows us to detect incredibly, incredibly ludicrously weak signals that otherwise would be absolutely impossible to look for. So we, I spent most of my PhD looking for the signatures of gold nanoparticles with the idea being to attach those gold nanoparticles to things like maybe a therapeutic, like a drug or a molecule or something, and to watch it make its way into the cell and to determine whether it was able to do things like cross the cell membrane, whether it was able to get to the right organelle within the appropriate um, place within the cell or any of those sorts of things. But my PhD went from, man, it'd be really good if we had this instrument, <laughs> but we don't. <laughs> and Time to make, make it. it. <laughs> yeah, all the way to, okay, cool. Let's see if we can actually apply it. I'm looking at a gold down particle or traveling as well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it was really good. You know, I was doing uh, wet lab chemistry. Um, I was obviously doing quite a lot of optics and engineering and like writing software to control everything. Um, and I had a wonderful experience in that I was pretty much the only person in the lab. So I really got to see the full spec of what it means to go from like, wow, we've got an absolutely crazy idea to, hey, it kind of works, um, which was quite rewarding. It was just me and my supervisor and my supervisor was absolutely fantastic, but obviously was busy. So wasn't there for much hands-on kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it was an exercise in kind of learning how to learn, which I think is the point of a PhD. Um, basically, like how do you look at any sort of subject and go as quickly as humanly possible to tip top knowledge, preferably world leading knowledge, if you possibly can, uh, in the shortest space of time, you can do it, um, which was really good. Uh, the PhD student before me and the PhD student after me uh, I didn't have any luck on the same project. Mm -hmm. And so I think I was there literally at exactly the right place at exactly the right time for this serendipitous window where the thing kind of worked pretty darn well. Uh, and then on leaving, you know, I smashed it into the ground so the next PhD student would have yeah. to, no, yeah, didn't do good that. luck. It just, yeah, it just, it just kind of, uh, you know, the knowledge kind of died. Um, but yeah, no, it was a good PhD. I'd recommend a PhD to almost anyone if the goal is to learn how to learn. Otherwise, it's uh, 
you know, it's, it's quite a heavy lift, um, arguably. Sure. And how, how does that, I mean, that, that obviously seems like quite the challenge. I mean, you had to, you did a lot of engineering in terms of actually modifying the electron microscope to realize this. That's, that strikes me as one of the most challenging aspects of that. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's, it's all optical. So it's just using lasers, mm -hmm. really powerful lasers. Mm -hmm. So it's not within a um, electron microscope uh, or anything. It's all free space propagating lasers that are bouncing around Amazing. one of those crazy Amazing. optical tables that you might have seen. Um, but yeah, up until that point, I'd taken zero optics. Uh, so it's a bit of an education. Um, but I think that kind of taught me the difference between what like real knowledge is versus what book knowledge is. Like I could read all the books and you know pass as many exams as you possibly wanted in optics and would still have been absolutely useless at putting one of those things together. Um, it really was building kind of a heuristic of like how how the instrumentation and how I guess the universe works uh, and then how I could tweak things within either the instrumentation or how we were producing things to make it work hopefully slightly better. So it's fighting a lot of like signal to noise problems. I mean these nanoparticles are like you know a few hundred gold atoms so like well below the diffraction limit should be absolutely optically impossible to detect um, but the, the device is so sensitive um, that you are finally able to see them after you know two years or so of fiddling around with this sort of stuff um, yeah it was, a, it was a good process it was a good process mm -hmm. I forgot what the original question was so was just a bit of a round no just asking about, about uh, <laughs> the engineering aspect of sort of that project uh, a follow-up question as well is, has has the technique seen any application? I mean, that sounds extremely useful, especially if it can be done in situ at some later point, so. Yeah, I um, I wish it did. I think it, you know, it needed a whole bunch more work. It probably would have benefited at some stage from um, jumping out of the lab if it was going to be viable um, and having, like, a dedicated team kind of focus on it. I guess, like, that's a bit of the disadvantage of academia, right? Like, it's it progresses at the speed of the group and our group was catastrophically underfunded. Uh, I spent the last three months of my PhD like take like begging companies that make cover slip glass, you know, like the cheapest mm, yeah. commodity in the whole world, like really thin mm. pieces of glass that you put yeah. on a microscope. I had to beg for mm. free samples of that to put my like samples on and no, run like wow. the last experiments for the PhD. So we just like didn't have any money. So I think, um, you know, again, why we didn't have any money that's kind of interesting right like nanophysics was heavily funded by all governments around the world because it was supposed to be like quantum the next revolution but the implicit handshake of government funding those sorts of things is that there's an economic return for the research activity right so what they are saying essentially is like okay we'll give you all this cash do all this interesting research generate things that turn into whatever instrumentation companies or new techniques or new products or something spin them out return to the economy plus plus some uh and we'll keep funding it right and that handshake never happened nanophysics kind of did the interesting hype probably nail in the coffin was graphene which still most people don't really know what to do with but yeah. some interesting things are happening with it um and you know yeah all the funding kind of went away so i entered the field right when there was just not a good time to seek any fun that's ultimately why i joined a startup company i'd thought from like you know, age 10 or 12, I was like, I'm going to be a physics professor, <laughs> 12 year old me. Um, but reality hit when there was like one postdoc position available in, in the field. And I think it was in like Texas or something for three months. And mm. I was like, do I want to uproot my whole life to go to Texas for three months to then look for oh, another no. job? Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'll just join this quote unquote real world and try and work things out from there. Yeah, I see. And you, you already got to the heart of my next question, which is, what is what's your take sort of on whether nanotechnology will be this? Because I've had the same experience as you and I'm sure everyone else where it's sort of framed like this will underpin the bulk of future technologies, change the world. And to, to an extent, I'm sure that will be true. But thus far in what's actually hit the market and, and made a substantial impact, I mean, one of the few examples that comes to mind is you know, QLED displays. And there's some, I think, some medicinal applications at this point, but it's still relatively sparse. So do you yeah. think we're just actually farther from that point or is it really never going to come to fruition? Um, yeah, good question. I think things are coming through the pipelines. I think, you know, just referencing back to the hype curve, I suppose, it's always difficult to know where you are 
on that eventuality. Um, mm -hmm. I think where we are at the moment, just in terms of science and science becoming a quickly realizable, impactful commodity producing entity, is that we're coming much closer to bridging the gap between science and engineering, right? So things that were otherwise only the remit of the big, the big, uh, the big guys out there, you know, the GSKs, the GEs, AstraZeneca's, etc., now are much more feasible to do for small startup teams because the tool sets are more democratized and more matured. Um, so I think, I guess, the same way that we saw. You know, the early 2000s really driven by um, software companies. I think we will see the next, maybe forever, you know, next many decades at least, driven by fundamental science companies. Um, just because, you know, we're getting ludicrously, ludicrously good at engineering biology, you know, not biology of 20 years ago where nothing was reliable and you could do it once if the stars aligned and everyone had had their yeah. breakfast um, but actually like systematically doing useful bio you know that's a game changer as soon as you have that you'll get explosions of technological capability um, and does that how does that map to nano i mean nano is an important piece of that right because nano is basically we couldn't come up with a good word for where does chemistry, biology, and physics intersect, and electronics, I guess, yeah. intersect? Like, that's nano, right? It's just that mm -hmm. space. Um, so I think it will inevitably, inevitably have um, a really big part to play over the next kind of decade or so. And already we're seeing a bunch of companies. Like, I make, I poke fun at graphene, but there's like six viable graphene companies I can think of just off the top of my head. Um, so it's happening. It's, it just was about five years after when we needed it to be. Sure. And then similarly, how, what are your thoughts on some of those hot button uh, scientific topics we already mentioned? Again, fusion, quantum computing. I mean, I think you made a, visu uh, a video or, or several videos probably about both topics. Are those are those similarly distant or and but but imminent or how do you feel about them? Um, I mean, fusion's definitely going to take a little while. So yeah, don't no one needs to immediately hold your get breath. their heads up. Yeah, but equally, it doesn't really matter, I suppose, because what we are unpicking in our capable like what we're learning whilst unpicking those really big problems is valuable in its own right you know like a lot of people get disenchanted by the fact that something like a quantum computer is still who knows how long away like at least five ten yeah. many 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 um but it doesn't matter because you're seeing quantum companies in the market today like they aren't quantum computing but they are quantum inspired and they are out performing classical approaches to doing the same uh, techniques. Like, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a whole host, but um, they're kind of like quantum ancillary or quantum inspired is usually how they're referred to. So like the quantum revolution is absolutely real and it's absolutely here already. Not the quantum computer yet, that's one maybe big piece of it. Um, mm. But, you know, our capabilities across things like metrology, there's a really interesting company in Bristol that uses essentially a, a laser pointer, the strength of a genuine laser pointer that you can buy off the shelf uh, that's in the infrared, fires it down at the ground. In the infrared, the ground is basically like a mirror so that some of those photons scatter back up um, to what they've mounted it on a drone. And by using some quantum algorithms and quantum detection capabilities that have been built because we're trying to build a photonic quantum computer, they can do sensing for things like methane emissions or CO2 emissions or any other gas that's got wow. an obvious absorption spectra. Um, and they can, well, where they're trying to do it is to fly up and down things like oil and gas pipelines and detect CO2, methane leaks, etc., etc. But the classical way of doing that was to get something the size of like a small Land Rover and fly it off the bottom of a helicopter at like great expense. And now there's this quantum device, which maybe is the size of your fist that you can fly off the bottom of a drone for a fraction of the cost that just is at utterly changing the game in those sorts of fields. Like people with classical approaches just can't compete, you know, and we're moving a whole bunch of telecoms industries over to quantum secured in preparation for having quantum computers. So like the world is changing. Um, it's maybe just not immediately the thing, the big ticket item that you're promised, but there's a lot of opportunity creation. In some of the other bits kind of like, you know, to use an overly played out analogy is the space race analogy, right? Like we're going to go try and do this really ambitious task. And as a consequence, we're going to have a lot of fall off technologies that are interesting and help to solve that 
end goal that are viable in their own right for other things. Um, so I actually think it's a really interesting space to be in. Yeah, completely agreed, of course. And then how do you feel about the flip side of this? Because at the same, on the one hand, all of this is obviously very exciting and, and everyone for the most part would agree that we hope this comes as quickly as possible. But there's obviously also a danger there as well because you know we're now in an era where these technologies are individually so powerful that they can change the world in potentially catastrophic ways. So are there any of these technologies that, that really are concerning to you? I mean, you hear artificial intelligence, you hear again the same sort of examples, but I think it actually goes well beyond that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there are <laughs> lots. Um, I mean, I think just as humanity, <laughs> we're obviously much more capable at innovating than we are at understanding how to control those innovations or how people may use them. Um, and I think, you know, there's a, we don't need to go into any sorts of specifics, I suppose, but like, mm. th there's a whole bunch of things that are becoming, it's, you know, it's back, it's back kind of what we said already. It's like, as you get better at kind of blurring or shortening the pathway between fundamental science and now it's engineering and right. Engineering's kind of easy mm -hmm. by comparison. No offense to any engineers. Um, <laughs> As, as you get better at doing more of those fundamental science translation pieces than anyone off the street or in a garage or something like that can be picking up those tool sets and using them, right? Like that's the power of software. The fact that you can be seven years old and be writing code, like in, I'm not sure how long, but it won't be in the, it won't be in the distant, distant future. You'll be able to pick up really capable genetic or other tool sets and experiment with them if you have the resource to push them in the first place and i think you know there's a whole bunch of problems with that um, there's a whole bunch of problems with those end of the spectrum i mean you know a lot of people are worried about ai i think ai is equally a little could absolutely be a, a, a problem for humanity i think all of the biological capability is much 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 more easily uh mm -hmm. not even purposefully abused just like accidentally abused you know um, so yeah, there's, I think it, it kind of comes back to why I think it's so important that scientists have a seat at the table, right? Um, and that the remit of what it means to be a scientist no longer ends at the lab, because now the boundary between like science and what society is experiencing is very proximal, right? Like, I mean, we saw it obviously through COVID, um, but equally, I think what that means for scientists is that they need to step up their level of worldly understanding, because um, I think it's very easy to sit in that kind of ivory tower piece and not really understand how the real world actually works, like what levers there are to play in, uh, to pull on, why why industries, markets, people, governments, policymakers, whatever, do the things that they do. And I guess that's why I feel so interested that scientists also have that kind of startup understanding because the downside of being a startup is basically like everything's out to kill you <laughs> whether it's policy makers governments competitors mm -hmm. markets the media whoever you know like there's threats Everyone. kind of from on all angles so you just need to be like omnipotently aware <laughs> of everything i suppose which is a really good education in to say well how do i change things to be to move in the direction that i want them to and how can i use my technical understanding to hopefully mean that that's in line with best practice. Um, so there's a nuanced kind of role, I think, emerging for scientists, but I think it's increasingly important that they find themselves not just in advisory roles within government, but actually in proper political roles. Um, I, I don't think it's okay. I mean, you saw, right, like when all the old guys invited Facebook in, <laughs> when all the old guys mm -hmm. in, the, in the Senate, yeah. in the House uh, invited Facebook in, like they were just asking questions like totally disconnected from how technology actually works because they are totally disconnected from technology, how, how it actually works. Uh, and you can't afford to do that with some of the things that are coming up and equally with a lot of the problems that we're experiencing in the world, right? Like we don't have a scientifically literate political system necessarily, and yet we're facing increasingly scientifically founded problems, um, be they climate change or pandemic or otherwise. So yeah, 
there we go. That was kind of deeper to get into than maybe necessarily I was thinking. But something no, that's perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. <laughs> no, no, that's perfect. Yeah, I've, I've thought about this a lot because you're absolutely correct. I mean, when I've seen, when I watch something like, like uh, Zuckerberg at Congress or anything similar, the gap in knowledge is, is very apparent. Yeah. And it is, oh, it's a difficult problem to solve. I mean, you can think of perhaps there needs to be new types of advisory boards or, yeah, maybe just more scientists directly involved in politics. But as that gap continues to grow, I mean, even something like climate change, which is, you know, fleshed out quite clearly, I think, you know, the vast majority of people would agree. And but when you go ahead and explain to somebody with no scientific background, like I even just think in my own case and certain family members and, and the like, it quickly just sounds like magic. Because if you come from a place of you have maybe just this vague sense of atoms, molecules, but you don't even quite, you know, in an abstract sense, know what that means. You start hearing, you know, a conversation about isotopes and, and various different types of measurements. And it just it's, it's, it's effectively meaningless. So it's quite the challenge for sure. And it's it's concerning because, totally. as you said, I think that will continue to just become a, a, a progressively bigger problem yeah I, so I, uh, we're, we're agree mm -hmm. so i won't i don't want to keep you too much longer so i'll get to one of my final questions okay. which is uh i think you I, i've i've previously asked a few guests some of these advice type questions and it feels perhaps a bit trite but in your case i think you are the perfect person to be inquiring for advice from so from the perspective of somebody pursuing a career in science, whether it be somebody very early on who's just sort of taking their first high school chemistry or physics course, or a postdoc who's kind of in a similar position as you were and considering to do something entrepreneurial or go down a traditional research career, what are some of the pieces of advice that you might lend from your own experience? Um, I think, I, I think maybe, well, maybe this message comes in at different points depending on where uh, someone like that would be kind of along their journey. But I think a really important lesson I'd learned probably too late was not to overly identify as like a, well, particularly in my case, like a, an optical nanophysicist specializing in, you know, quantum photonics, say. Like that's really an, a niche of niche kind of definitions. And actually the, at worst, how I should be defining myself as a physicist, preferably just as a scientist, preferably just as someone who can look at problems and think sensibly about how to solve those problems. I think it's really easy to go through the system and um, not realize how unbelievably transferable the skill set of looking at things with an analytical headspace and trying to solve them um, actually is. It translates into absolutely everything. The other piece I would say is that, um, I guess the world, <laughs> we're going deep here, the world, <laughs> isn't necessarily a meritocracy, right? In that no matter how particularly good you are at getting great grades or being a fantastic scientist or being great in your job, regardless of what your job is, out, totally outside of science, um, it's your ability to, the most valuable skill set is your ability to explain a concept and bring people around to your way of thinking and to rally them towards the action that you hope hopefully well-informed hope are, uh, you know, driving for. That's actually the magic skill set that really moves the dial. And I, for a very long time, assumed it would be, you know, I've got X number of scientific papers that I've published, or I went to this university, or this thing happened to me that I can talk to people. It's not that. It's absolutely, when it comes down to it, like your ability to sit in one-on-one -on -one or one-in-group settings and provide and encourage direction and help people also achieve that because everything difficult to do is not done by an individual everything difficult to do is done by multiple people and i think it's very mm -hmm. easy particularly within the scientific world to view like you know the the figureheads that get their names appended to nobel prizes and actually it's hundreds of people probably that went into moving those kind of concepts forward um so i would say like that is the biggest takeaway that I have had in the past kind of five years of being out of the PhD. My skill set to make things happen is the really interesting bit that means that I can carve a career path for myself and it doesn't matter, you know, what I pick, whether it's being a lecturer in university or whether it's running a startup company, whether it's advising businesses, whether it's helping investors, whether it's going to politics or policy or anything in between, you know, your ability to motivate and help people 
find alignment is really the skill set that um, dictates most strongly whether you'll be successful or not. Uh, and then I would also say try and start your own thing because then you get to make up your job and then it's not work if you get to make up your job. Um, that's, yeah. that's also a good, good kind of take on it. No, absolutely. I mean, that that's uh, me. But just as a fun fact, I left my position as a consultant actually just about a week ago. Uh, not awesome. only for this, I'm not not too crazy. I have a, another personal project that I'm working on as well. So I agree completely. Very cool. Very yeah. exciting. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, okay, I'll, I'll let you go there because I feel like my next question will be, will take us into far more than 10 or 15 minutes. So okay, cool. I will leave you be. But really, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. It was a lovely conversation and hopefully we can do it again in the future. Awesome. Likewise. Thanks very much for having me. Much appreciated. Perfect. Thank you. Have a good one.